to make a cryptocurrency successful, you have to make it real. It has to come to the real world and you have to be able to use it. This woman, Dr. Ruja Ignatova, stole billions of dollars from her clients and disappeared into thin air. Till today, no one knows where she is. And till this very moment, no one, not even the FBI, has been able to recover a dime from the billions she stole. So who is she? How did she scam billions from millions? And how on earth did Dr. Ruja Ignatova become the world's most wanted woman? Humble beginnings. A lot of Ruja Ignatova's background is shrouded in mystery, but official government records state that she was born on the 30th of May in 1980 in a Russian-controlled Bulgaria. Since the mid-20th century, Bulgaria has been riddled with corruption. So, in a way, it's not too shocking that it served as the birthplace for Ruja, one of the world's biggest and most successful scam artists. However, records also show that Ruja didn't spend all of her life in Bulgaria. When she was just 10, her family moved to Schramburg, Germany, perhaps in search of a better life and more opportunities. There, her father found work in a tire shop. But his meager wages could hardly sustain his family. They were poor, dirt poor. So poor that Ruja, her younger brother, her father and mother were forced to squat in a small apartment above a butcher shop. Every night, while Ruja struggled to sleep through the deafening squeals and groans of animals butchered below, she made it her life's goal to pull herself and her family out of poverty. Luckily for her, she was on the right side of the genetic lottery. She was brilliant and hardworking. It was a lethal combination that impressed everyone, including her immigrant parents. And anyone who has had immigrant parents would tell you just how demanding they can be. She even impressed her teachers, to the point that one of them claimed Ruja was the smartest student he'd ever taught. Unfortunately, Ruja couldn't have it all, because her social life balanced things out. To keep it short, simple, and sweet, she had no social life. You see, Ruja's background had forced her to adopt an aspirational approach towards her life. Despite the fact that she was poor, and despite the fact that everyone around her knew she was poor, Ruja refused to accept her reality. She was in active resistance to what appeared to be her fate. Ruja carried herself like she was born rich. She wore bright red lipstick donned pristinely clean uniforms, and did her best to wear only pretty dresses. This carefully curated image alienated her peers because they felt she was pretentious and snobbish. One schoolmate would recall that nobody in school got really close to her. But this didn't affect Ruja in the slightest. To be quite frank, she didn't care. She was obsessed with only one thing, overcoming poverty. By the time Ruja turned 18, she had gained admission to the prestigious Constanz University. At this point, you can imagine how proud her parents were, but from Ruja's perspective, she'd not even begun. By 2005, Ruja graduated with a doctorate in law and would later go on to add a master's degree in comparative European law from Oxford to her CV. However, in university, Ruja still lacked social skills. She was aloof, but once again, she was at the top of her class, and just like before, that was all that mattered to her. It was the key to a future where she would never be poor again. And she was close. She could smell it. Because despite all the odds stacked against her, Ruja had come this far. By 2008, her dreams came true. Upon graduation, she got an exclusive of job at the elite McKinsey Consulting Company in Sofia, Bulgaria. Soon enough, she rose to the top and began representing top banks. Her colleagues would recall how proficient she was at her job, how lazy she made everyone look because of how hard she worked. One former client would even fondly recall her as one of those people you could email any time of day or night and receive a reply within minutes. Meanwhile, Ruja would also tell her clients that she had no desire for children or a family because she was too busy trying to change the world. Now, if you've been paying attention to Ruja's character growth all this while, while you probably recognize this for the proof of her growing narcissism. Because if you hadn't noticed already, somewhere along the line, somewhere on her life's journey to pull herself out of poverty, the Bulgarian native had developed a savior complex. By her definition, her quest for financial freedom would lead to the salvation of humanity. It was ridiculous on paper, but it was what she believed. Now, I could be wrong. There is a chance that Ruja was indeed planning on changing the world in her own way. But unfortunately for her, she had no idea that the world had its own plans, and it was about to change her life forever. A new chapter. I wake up every single night thinking, what could I have done differently? This is a pain that will stay with me for the rest of my life. In 2008, the global financial market ground to a startling halt. Then, it collapsed. Every business suffered as the world's economy plunged into one of the worst recessions since the Great Depression of the 1920s. By 2009, Ruja's employer, McKinsey, could no longer afford to run their branch in Bulgaria. They closed up shop, and suddenly, Ruja found herself jobless. You can imagine how disoriented she must have been as she searched for a new job. It had happened so devastatingly quick that her definition of financial freedom began to take on a new definition. Despite the setback, Ruja 
Deja was qualified and relentless enough to quickly recover. She got a job in Bulgaria's biggest investment firm. However, the damage was already done. What Ruja now wanted was generational wealth, the kind of money that would insulate her in the event of another global financial crisis. She was tired of being a victim of the system. She had lost her first job under circumstances beyond anyone's control, so what assurance did she have that the same wouldn't happen to her second? Ruja needed to diversify, so she did just that. She branched out, dabbled in tons of businesses until she had a successful cosmetics line and was neck deep in the Bulgarian political scene. During this time, she also refined her social skills till she knew how to make and keep friends and could approach and sell herself to anyone. However, none of these achievements meant much to her. Why? She still wasn't as rich as she wanted to be. There was still a volatility attached to her businesses, to her newly acquired riches, because while she was rich, the money she had wasn't life-changing. And it was only life-changing money that could insulate her from another event like the 2008 financial meltdown. As Ruja toiled through sleepless nights, looking for what business could open up these levels of wealth to her, she stumbled on on something, a word, a concept with boundless potential. Ruja Ignatova found Bitcoin, or you could say Bitcoin found her. I'll ask you one last question. You don't like Bitcoin? You wouldn't invest in Bitcoin? Do you invest in the stock market at this moment? So not at this moment. I think it's high. Uh, so I have not invested in the stock market at this moment. I have in the past, but I have not at this moment. I think it's high. Uh, Bitcoin, I, I just seems like a scam. In early 2013, cryptocurrency was as strange as rocket science. Bitcoin was still freakishly new and not many people knew what it was, but it had already begun gaining a steady momentum. The value of the coin had passed $500 and people were beginning to get rich overnight. Meanwhile, on the other side of the financial fence, critics had already begun calling it out as the currency for crime, money launderers and drug dealers. It's not clear what drew Ruja's attention, the potential of Bitcoin or its capacity for nefarious applications. It's also not clear how corrupt Ruja was prior to her crypto landing in 2013, but you have to consider the fact that she was an investment banker in post-Soviet post-financial crisis Bulgaria, with both feet in her country's corridors of power and a gnawing desperation for a mind-boggling amount of wealth. I'll let you come to your own conclusion. In the meantime, Ruja was about to dive headfirst into a complex field she knew nothing about, and she was about to do it with the worst of intentions. The birth of one coin. Ruja was built differently, and nothing highlighted that difference more than the way she decided to approach the crypto space. While others were buying Bitcoin, Ruja decided to create her own. It would be a version that people could trust, a version that wouldn't be a vehicle for crime and corruption, or at least that was the story she was selling. But where was she going to start from? In November of 2013, Ruja attended a cryptocurrency seminar in Singapore, where she somehow managed to get a speaker's slot. When she climbed the stage, she pitched her idea. With her thorough understanding of banking and finance, she presented the framework for a crypto-based pension plan. She named this crypto pension plan OneCoin. And as she sold the idea at the seminar, one man, Sebastian Greenwood, took special interest in her idea. He approached her and offered his expertise and brains for a slot as a founding partner of OneCoin. But what could he offer her? The answer was simple, structure. And that structure came in the form of MLM, multi-level marketing, or in simpler terms, a pyramid Ponzi scheme. Now, if there was an honest bone in Ruja's body, she would have backed out at this point. Pyramid schemes had already existed for decades at this point, and they had already destroyed more lives than anyone could care to count. Heck, it was Bernie Madoff's pyramid scheme that upended the financial market in 2008 to begin with and caused Ruja to lose her job in McKinsey. If Ruja was honest, she would have turned Sebastian down, but she wasn't. She wanted life-changing money. And so, the unholy union began. As Sebastian laid down one coin's infrastructure in the background, Dr. Ruja functioned as the spokesperson. She sold the idea in seminars to her friends, to her political network, her customers, and with time, the entire world. In 2014, ladies and gentlemen, OneCoin was launched officially as a company, the literal beginning of the end. The cult called OneCoin. What happened is actually that we have currently a mining waiting list of several months. So it means you join today the mining pool and you will receive your coins in three or four months. The infrastructure of OneCoin was built using the framework of MLM schemes. These schemes work on a first-come, first-served basis. An enticing starter package is dangled in front of unsuspecting, often desperate individuals who sign up with their money and sign people under them who are called their downline. For every downline and individual signs, they receive a commission. And if that downline signs their own downline, the individual is entitled to a commission from both downlines. It is an incestual profiteering ladder structure where the money flows from the bottom to the top and not the other way around. 
In simpler terms, the higher up on the pyramid you are, the more people you have under you, the more you earn. Those closer to the bottom mostly run on gas and vibes. This was the structure Dr. Ruja and Sebastian employed for OneCoin. In their case, they sold OneCoin in the form of educational packages. These educational packages contained tokens that allowed its user to mine OneCoin. Yeah. Now, these educational packages could cost anything from $100 to $100,000. So, if you were interested, you would have given Dr. Ruja and her accomplices $100 or three more zeros for whatever equivalent of one coin they deemed fit. The buyers were told that their coins would be turned into money eventually when the time was right. In the meantime, all they had to do was buy up coins and count the days until they could reap the benefit. Now, I don't need to tell you that this was nothing short of daylight robbery, the kind of robbery that I'm sure you're probably sure you wouldn't have fallen for. But before you make those claims, let me explain why you wouldn't have easily detected the scam and why the people who fell for the scam weren't particularly stupid. There's a reason why Sebastian approached Dr. Ruja, and there's a reason why he allowed her to continue as the face of the organization. Ruja Ignatova was electric. She sold her personality first, not the coin. She knew that people don't buy because of utility, they buy because of how you make them feel. And since she was selling them on obscure technology that would make them rich, she had to look the part. With her lavishly gorgeous gowns, bright red lipsticks, entourage, and insanely luxurious lifestyle, there were very few people who weren't seduced by her charm. You either loved her or hated her, but you couldn't ignore her. But wait, you could still insist that it could never be you. You could be certain that you would have smoked her out with proper research, which again, you are certain her followers didn't do. Well, that's where you're wrong. Because, like we established earlier, Ruja wasn't just a pretty face. She had the brains and the certificates to back it up. She was a seasoned investment banker who had studied in one of Germany's most prestigious universities and then gone further by studying in one of the world's best. She also had a good track record and high value clients who had vouched for her. You can only imagine how impressive her LinkedIn profile must have looked like back in those days. There is no way on earth you would have seen that back then and thought, oh yeah, that's definitely a scammer. But wait, I know there's still a but in there. I know you're probably thinking to yourself, but she has no background in crypto. I would have taken that as a red flag. And once again, you would be wrong because this is where context takes center stage. In 2014, no one knew what crypto was. And most of the people who invested their money into the blockchain either tried, failed, and ultimately gave up trying to understand what the technology was or didn't care to even understand it in the first place. I mean, if I asked you to explain the intricacies of PayPal, how they processed your finances and how they made money as a company, would I get a detailed response or silence and butterflies? Exactly. And yet, we trust PayPal with our money. So, in that same vein, the only thing that most OneCoin and Bitcoin users cared about was that it remitted profits over time. But, unlike Bitcoin, OneCoin users were convinced that theirs was superior. It was a second chance. And it didn't help that Dr. Ruja was selling the coin to them as the Bitcoin killer. To make things worse, members of this one coin were also called investors, which today sounds like an insult. These investors became part of a network called One Life. They were added to WhatsApp groups where they were supposedly given insider information. And believe it or not, they were fed one coin propaganda. The investors were told that anyone who questioned one coin was a hater that should be rightfully ignored. They even had their own hand symbols, which people would use when meeting other members of One Life. To be quite frank, one coin functioned exactly like a financial cult. Individuals like Jenna McAdams, who eventually became one of the most popular victims of the scam after she invested $10,000 of her money and got her friends and family to invest $250,000, found herself initially publicly defending OneCoin against someone who had researched and discovered that the entire thing was a scam. But it gets worse. This was just the first phase. What Dr. Ruja and her team had tasted was mild success. They were about to take things to the next level. The global scam. One coin was growing, business was good, but there was still one problem. They weren't growing fast enough. It was at this point in One Coin's growth that Dr. Ruja and her partner, Sebastian, stumbled on an insanely successful MLM agent known as Igor Alberts. Igor was the quintessential pyramid scheme guy who had run the MLM meter to its very extreme. He had hundreds, if not thousands, of people under him who functioned as his downline in the several MLMs that he had sucked dry. Over the 30 years before he met Dr. Ruja, he claimed to have made over 100 million euros. Whether you believe him or not, this money funded his lavish lifestyle, an Aston Martin and a Maserati, a wardrobe of black and gold thousand dollar Dolce outfits that he claimed inspired discipline in him, a gated mansion in the Netherlands. It's safe to say that he was at the very least rich, but despite his riches, he recognized that one coin was on another level. In May 2015, Igor was invited to a one coin seminar in Dubai, and after listening to Dr. Ruja, he was so convinced that he ordered all his salespeople, every downline 
deadline he had to buy the coin. The result? They made 90,000 euros out of nothing in their first month. Dr. Ruja had figured that it was more convenient and efficient to piggyback one coin on established MLM sellers with huge downlines than managing an MLM scheme themselves. According to the FBI, she privately referred to this method as the big of Wall Street meets MLM. With time, Igor Alberts was making more than 1 million euros a month from one coin. The coin became the biggest product in the network marketing industry, and soon, other network marketers were drawn to it like flies to a turd. 60% of income would go to the marketers, and the remaining 40% would go to one coin. Unfortunately, most of these marketers were naive enough to invest a significant amount of their 60% cash to buy more one coin, because they were convinced they were going to earn a fortune. For example, Igor was convinced that he would become a billionaire from one coin. He was quoted saying, I did the calculation of how many coins we needed to become the richest person on the planet. We need to build it up to 100 million coins, because when this coin goes to 100 euros and we have 100 million, we are richer than Bill Gates. It's mathematic. It's easy as that. This ridiculousness was the final product of greed, and that greed was widespread, because everyone was about to be a victim. Everyone except Dr. Ruja and her inner circle. However, individuals like Igor could lose millions and still turn out fine. It was victims like Jen McAdams, who, at this point, had invested her late father's entire life savings into OneCoin, and that was deeply concerning. People like her made the bulk of OneCoin's wealth. People like her were the real victims, because it was people like her that would lose everything and find it almost impossible to recover. The Mysterious Disappearance of Dr. Ruja Over 70,000 euro for it. I think you know. A lot of you have been donating to this charity. Thank you very much. A lot of you are supporting this charity. This footage is from Dr. Ruja's Wembley appearance in June 2016. She was 36 at the time, and she still had the hearts and minds of her OneCoin users on lock. OneCoin had exploded. In just a little over two years, they had amassed over 3 million investors from everywhere from the US to China and Africa. But there was a problem with OneCoin. It was a problem that made it more ridiculously dangerous than most of the pump and dump schemes of our common age. You probably have already guessed what it was, but in case you haven't, no event better better illustrates this problem than the incident with a Norwegian blockchain expert called Bjorn Bjerke. On October 2016, just four months after the Wembley appearance, Bjorn Bjerke was contacted by a recruitment agent with a curious job offer. A cryptocurrency startup from Bulgaria that was sold as the replacement of Bitcoin was looking for a chief technical officer. In return, Bjerke would get an apartment, a car, and an attractive annual salary of about £250,000. Bjorn was puzzled. While he might have been qualified, it was still a massive undertaking with serious consequences. But that was the least of his concerns. What piqued his suspicions was the fact that there were no details about the job description. While his potentially new employers had been quick to offer him a hefty salary and benefits, they hadn't given him a hint of what would be required of him. So, he decided to ask them the question directly, and their response was, at the very least, baffling. Well, first of all, we need a blockchain. We don't have a blockchain today. Wait, what? Bjorn could hardly believe what he was hearing. How could a crypto company that had been receiving money from people on the promise that they were backing the replacement of Bitcoin not have its own blockchain. It turned out they wanted him to build the blockchain for them post haste. So Bjorn Bjerke asked the recruitment agent, what's the name of this company? They replied, it's OneCoin. Bjorn immediately turned down the job. Bjorn had a fair sense of what was going on. He was familiar with the OneCoin scam, but what he and hundreds of thousands of investors didn't know was that OneCoin was also building on fire. A building that Dr. Ruja was trying desperately to save. A building that was now doomed to fail, especially after Bjorn turned down their offer. However, and this is what was most unfortunate, no one but those in the OneCoin admin knew that the building was burning. Because as they struggled to steer the ship, people kept boarding with thousands of dollars in investment. But they were able to maintain the facade. Most people still didn't suspect anything. And from an external perspective, things remained normal for OneCoin until 2017. 2017 was the year that the company began falling apart by brick. In April of 2017, the Indian police became the first law enforcement agency to really crack down on OneCoin. OneCoin organizers had set up a recruiting seminar in Mumbai. Mumbai. They had begun recruiting people and taking their money when the Mumbai police cracked down on them and arrested 18 of the organizers. Unfortunately, the police couldn't retrieve the money because the same organizers had already transferred the money before they had received it. How much was the money? $11 million. The spotlight was turning red, Lady Justice was getting prepped, and Ruja could feel the walls closing in. But these were just external issues. Internally, investors, OneCoin users, had gotten terribly impatient. They were getting tired of waiting for their OneCoin to be turned into cash. Dr. Ruja's 
solution was to organize a European summit for OneCoin users, which was scheduled for October 2017 in Lisbon, Portugal. At this event, Dr. Ruja promised that the issue would be resolved. But when the October event came, Ruja was nowhere to be found. If it was anyone else, the alarm bells would have been quiet. But this was unlike Ruja. This was the first time she would be missing a OneCoin event, any event for that matter. She had also never been late. Dr. Ruja had always been extremely punctual, and she ensured that everyone in her circle followed suit. So, when Dr. Ruja didn't show up in October of 2017, when she didn't respond to their texts and calls, when no one could tell where she was, and when it seemed like she had disappeared from the face of the earth, everyone feared the worst. But while her inner circle had a fair guess of what had really happened, most of the OneCoin users were certain she had either been kidnapped or killed. It sounds crazy, I know, because as hard as it is to believe, Dr. Ruja had sold the idea to them that the big banks were after her because of her revolutionary coin. She already made a show of moving around with a number of bodyguards for protection. It was all hogwash, all right, but not all of it. And I'll tell you why. Because the true nature of OneCoin's inner circle extends beyond Ruja's admin itself to shadowy individuals with higher levels of power and influence with deeper and darker tendencies. In the meantime, Ruja's younger brother, Constantine, would take over from her. But he was nowhere near as intelligent or as competent as his sister. In fact, the admin widely considered him to be a dimwit whose showmanship wasn't backed by any comprehensible strategy that profited anyone but himself. And to make matters worse for everyone, the US was now on their tails. In March of 2019, Constantine was about to board a flight from Los Angeles to Bulgaria when the FBI stopped him at the airport and arrested him on charges of money laundering and fraud. It was on the same day that the US officially declared one coin to be a fraud. It was a little too late. But now, this is where things get a little interesting. Two years before her brother's capture, the FBI had secretly charged Dr. Ruja on some charges and had been conducting some investigations. They had gotten close to tying up the case when Dr. Ruja suddenly disappeared. From all indications, it appeared that Dr. Ruja was tipped off. But by whom? Who was powerful enough to know what the FBI intended to keep a secret? While all of this was happening, Igor Albert began to realize that OneCoin was a scam after all. In December 2017, he asked for evidence of the blockchain. As expected, there wasn't any. And so, he quit. Can you imagine what happened to all the members of his pyramid? His thousand-member downline? The individuals who had given tens of millions of dollars through him in the name of network marketing. In the name of profits. The Aftermath so, where is Dr. Ruja really? The FBI claims to have an idea, according to records presented in court documents. On the 25th of October 2017, two weeks before she missed her European seminar, Ruja boarded a Ryanair flight from Bulgaria to Greece. That was the moment she disappeared from their radar. Okay, well that might give a hint to how she disappeared, where is the money? That's what the people really want to know. First of all, no one knows just how much was stolen. The only person that would have known would have been Dr. Ruja, but we don't know where on earth she is. Officially, the authorities believe that around 4 billion euros was stolen from customers. However, insiders believe it was as much as 15 billion euros. And to make matters a little more complicated, Dr. Ruja used sophisticated systems to hide the money. So complicated that the FBI knows where some of the money is, but can't figure out a legal way to seize it. For example, Ruja once bought a massive property in Sofia, Bulgaria's capital. That property was technically owned by one property, an obvious variant of one coin. However, on paper, one property is owned by another company, suspiciously called Risk Limited. Risk Limited was owned by Ruja at some point, but just before her disappearance, ownership of that company was transferred to some Panamanians. Okay, good. This means we can arrest the Panamanians, right? Well, not exactly. On the one hand, they are legally anonymous, so we don't know the identity of the Panamanians or if they even exist. On the other hand, the Panamanians in question are also managed by another company called Paragon. Paragon is owned by Artifix, and Artifix was owned by Ruja's mother, Veska, who sold the company in 2017 to another unknown individual in his 20s. Do not forget that we are talking about the ownership of just one house. This complex web of financial gymnastics is why it is impossible to seize the assets owned by OneCoin. But it gets deeper and darker. Do you remember when I spoke of some powerful shadowy figures in OneCoin's inner circle? Well, it was confirmed by almost everyone who was privy to the inner workings of OneCoin. When the blockchain expert Bjorn Bjerke, the same man who turned down the CTO job at OneCoin, discovered how much of a scam OneCoin was, he began speaking up about it. And unsurprisingly, Surprisingly, he received death threats. But it wasn't the death threats that scared Bjorn. It was who those death threats were coming from. He would later say, If I knew what I would have to go through, I would have never blown the whistle. I would have just turned my back and walked away. And when he was asked specifically who were behind the threats, he responded, I can't discuss that. It starts to get very, 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 very scary. Very, very, very fast. According to Bjarke, Dr. Ruja never expected OneCoin to grow so big. He claims that insiders who were with OneCoin from its early stages report that it was never supposed 
supposed to be a billion dollar scam. And if you go through some of her earlier videos, she gives a hint herself. Our project was much more successful than we expected. We have 2 million users. At some point, they say that she even tried to close it down, but those shadowy individuals wouldn't let her stop. Apparently, life-changing money was just a few tens of millions. However, the plot gets thicker still. Igor Albert was also questioned about the powers behind the curtains of OneCoin, and this was his response. No, I cannot tell that because I don't want to take that risk with our lives. It wasn't until Constantine, Ruja's brother, was questioned by the DOJ that he revealed that some of these individuals were players in Eastern European organized crime. But there could be more. Politicians, billionaires, corrupt law officials, or rotten government agents, who knows? The list is endless. And it might explain why Dr. Ruja has not been found till this day. For now, we know that just before she disappeared, Dr. Ruja had a daughter in late 2016. Her ex-husband is probably with their child in Frankfurt, but he insists on remaining anonymous. He has refused to grant interviews and has not been linked to her since her disappearance. We know that there have been some traces of her in Dubai and Russia, but no one can know for sure if it was even her. There is a strong possibility that she has gone under the knife and now travels the world with a new face and under multiple false identities. Some even believe she has transitioned and now lives a completely new life as a man. Some also believe that she is currently in Bulgaria, where she is under protection from the same powerful individuals who sponsored her all along. However, and this is where the situation takes a much darker turn, Bulgarian investigators recently found documents that claimed Dr. Ruja was in fact dead and unsurprisingly was killed by one of her powerful sponsors. The documents were found in the possession of a murdered Bulgarian policeman and they state that Ruja was allegedly intoxicated and murdered on a yacht in 2018 by a drug lord who wanted to bury evidence of his financial involvement with OneCoin. But, and there is always a but, Ignatova's body was never recovered because it was dismembered and dumped in the Ionian Sea, a body of water south of the Adriatic Sea between Italy and Greece. It's difficult to know what to believe at this point, but if you ask me, I wouldn't be surprised if they killed her. After all, while Ruja might have been their biggest asset, the moment OneCoin was exposed for what it truly was, she became their biggest liability.